Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. Today we're talking about Mr. Terence Howard and his theory of maths, which supposedly proves pretty much the history of science is wrong, or it would if it weren't nonsense. Now here's the thing, you should not have mathematicians, scientists and astrophysicists review his dissertation and theories because his problem isn't with maths. I know that everyone thinks that his problem is with maths, but it isn't, and that is the massive fallacy of this entire conundrum. Terence Howard, known for his acting roles in popular films like Iron Man, has developed his own unconventional theories about mathematics. He calls his theory teriology. Yeah, I know. And it revolves around his belief that 1 times 1 equals 2 rather than 1, as is universally accepted in mathematics. Now here are some key points about Terry's mathematical ideas. Howard argues that the current understanding of multiplication is flawed. He claims that 1 times 1 should equal 2 because, in his view, the square root of 4 is 2 and the square root of 2 is 1. He has developed a quote-unquote proof for his claim using plastic shapes he calls teriadrons, which he believes demonstrate his theory. Howard has stated that he wants to re-educate the world about mathematics and that he plans to publish a book detailing his ideas. Of course he does. And he claims that his theory has applications in various fields including space travel and energy production. It is important to note that Howard's views on mathematics are not accepted by the scientific community. His claims go against fundamental principles that have been rigorously proven and applied successfully for centuries. Despite the lack of scientific support, Howard remains passionate about his ideas and continues to promote them through interviews such as with Joe Rogan and social media. Now, before tackling the theory proper, I'd like to underline one thing. These views have not garnered the interest of the public due to their inherent scientific merit, but simply because of his status as a celebrity. Now, from my point of view, if we were to analyze this at a psychological level, I believe this is the result of an extremely narcissistic mind. I mean, he named his new mathematics after himself, after all. And my guess would be that this entire study is probably motivated by social cognition. But whatever the case, I'm no psychologist. I do believe my area of expertise, namely languages, might prove more apt to discuss his theory than maths itself. I would like to begin my analysis by focusing on two fundamental factors of his theory. One is the core foundation, 1 times 1 equals 2, that's the what, we could say. Once we destroy that, I'll show you something he said, a specific word which revealed it all. That could be considered the why of this discussion. And once you see it, everything will be clear. Let's watch. What's 1 times 1? 1 times 1 is 1. To multiply means to do what? To make more, right? Yes. Increase a in number? Yes. Multiply? Yes. How can one times one equaling one be part of the multiplication table? It fails to satisfy the term multiply. It doesn't multiply, does it? It should fit. So his problem may appear mathematical at first, but the reality is that the core of his discussion and argument is with languages, not with math. The surrounding discussion around the linguistic problem is instead mostly philosophical, as I'll demonstrate in the latter section of the video. Before showing you the linguistic problem, let's discuss the logics of it. Logically, the 1 times 1 equals 1 isn't a problem at all. There is no logical fallacy within this operation. You see, the second number here doesn't represent a different number nor entity as he claims, it represents the self. If you try and multiply one by, well, itself, which is the logics behind this operation, it doesn't add anything because there is no second element nor anything separate is being added to it. In this specific case, this, the equal symbol, is a mirror. Instead, the way he sees it is that the second element described by the number 1 is a separate entity. It isn't, and I can't believe I have to say this, but a multiplication isn't an addition and it doesn't work the same way. But since all we're talking about now is indeed maths, how is this a linguistic problem? Well, check this out. As you can see, he is fixating on the meaning of the word multiply upon which he builds the rest of his theory. Thing is though, this mathematical equation does not fail to satisfy the term multiply because in math mathematics, differently from in general use, the verb to multiply has a very specific meaning which denotes an exact operation. It does not have the broader meaning you ascribe to it, which is the usage in a general sense of the term. Allow me to elaborate. 
What this man is failing to understand, due to the fact that he has no linguistic training whatsoever, is that words do not just have one single meaning attached to them. He expects that single meaning ascribed to multiply to carry over and fit perfectly every communicative case. The reason why this sort of expectation from a linguistic level is both inappropriate and inaccurate, therefore leading to a irrelevant result, is because in languages you have a type or category of words which are called polysemic. Multiply is a polysemic word. A polysemic word is a lexical item that possesses multiple distinct yet related meanings or semantic variants. Polysemic words exhibit a phenomenon in which a single linguistic form is associated with several interrelated senses or interpretation. The semantic variations of polysemic words often arise through cognitive processes, such as metaphorical extensions, metonymy, or specialization of meaning. These processes allow the word to acquire new senses while retaining a connection to its original or core meaning. The relationship between the different senses of a polysemic word can be based on various factors including similarity, contiguity or functional association. Let me give you some practical examples. The word bank. Does any financial institution have to have anything in common specifically with the way we describe the bank of a river or a stream? And what about a data bank or a blood bank? Does the word light, which naturally describes the agent that allows sight, have to have everything in common with the adjective light, which describes weight? And also considering the fact that this remote is definitely light but it isn't light in color? And would Mr. How would have anything to complain about the utilization of the word run when talking about computer science. If I'm running a program, does it have to be fast? You see, polysemy is a pervasive feature of natural languages and contributes to the flexibility of expressiveness of linguistic communication. It allows for the efficient use of a limited vocabulary to convey a wide range of concepts and ideas. However, the interpretation of a polysemic word heavily relies on the context in which it appears, and the intended meaning is often disambiguated by the surrounding linguistic and pragmatic cues which this man is completely blind towards. In other words, if I say, look, this house is full of spirits, let's run away, am I a recovering alcoholic or am I afraid of ghosts? Likewise, the result of a multiplication operation is called the product. Are you, Mr. Howard, going to argue that a product needs to be a physical thing just because in a broader context a product is an item you buy at a store? Didn't think so. Distinguishing polysemy from homonymy is crucial in linguistic analysis. The diachronic development and etymological origin of the words play a significant role in determining whether they are polysemic or homonymous. Hence, your problem, Mr. Howard, is not with the operation itself, which would bring it to the field of mathematics, it's with the term we use to refer to it, thus making it a linguistic dispute. And once it becomes a linguistic discussion, then understanding polysemy is essential. It becomes essential to various fields, including lexicography, natural language processing, and cognitive linguistics, as it provides insight to the conceptual structure of language, the mechanism of semantic change, and the challenges of word sense disambiguation in computational contexts. And talking about context, the word multiply when used within the context of mathematics acquired just one fundamental meaning, describing a specific operation. And it is used in a finite sense in various branches of the discipline, including algebra, geometry, calculus, and number theory. Look, I'm a linguist. We can sit down and discuss whether or not the word multiply is fitting to describe the actual mathematical operation all day. But the fact remains that the operation it describes isn't faulty, nor incoherent, whether or not we want to argue that the word itself isn't the best or most apt. And this consideration alone is sufficient to refute his entire thesis. Now that we have debunked this part, I want to connect to what I was telling you before. Check this out. Focus on his exact vocabulary because this will give it all away. Watch. Okay, go to your calculator. Whatever the new... <laughs> no, go to okay. your calculator. Go to your calculator. All right. <laughs> go to calculator. Go to your calculator. Yeah, you I do got too. You. you got iPhone? What are we doing? I want both of y'all to do two separate things. I want to do the same thing to start with. Turn it to the side. Okay. You're mad. Someone programmed that lie in there and lied to you and you and everyone and all your fundamentals are off. He doesn't call it a mistake, he doesn't call it an incongruence, it's a lie, and it's placed there on purpose, therefore with the intent to deceive. Haha! -ha. This is the part of my analysis that uncovers a new layer to this entire discussion. Terry Howard's proposed theory is not a mathematical theory. 
nor a linguistic theory. It's a conspiracy theory. Let's now justify this statement with empirical research and critical thinking. The widespread belief in conspiracy theories which posits that significant events are orchestrated by powerful and nefarious entities working in secrecy is a common phenomenon amplified by social media that has become part of our daily lives as people of the 21st century. The motivations behind the acceptance of these theories has been extensively studied, and current research suggests that the allure of conspiracy theories can be attributed to a range of psychological needs, including the desire to comprehend one's surrounding, which we call epistemic motives, the need to feel secure and in command of one's environment, which we call existential motives, and the drive to maintain a favourable self-image and protect the reputation of a person within a social group, which we call social motives. In the words of Haida, finding casual explanations for events is a core part of building up a stable, accurate and internally consistent understanding of the world. Casual explanations serve the need for people to feel safe and secure in their environment and to exert control over the environment as autonomous individuals and as members of collectives. Conspiracy theories by their very nature involve a degree of conjecture as they propose covert activities that are shielded from the public eye. These theories often present intricate scenarios that require the synchronization of numerous players, adding to their complexity and by extension improbability. In other words, now that we know that to him this isn't a mistake, this isn't a misunderstanding, it is a systematic if not systemic worldwide deception that has been going on for centuries, which already in itself proves that his theory is indeed a conspiracy. Moreover, if you're still not convinced, conspiracy theories are notoriously difficult to disprove, as proponents argue that any attempts to debunk their claims may be part of the conspirators' elaborate efforts to maintain secrecy and spread misinformation. This inherent resistance to falsification suggests that those who endeavour to discredit conspiracy theories may, in fact, be seen as complicit in the alleged plot. While the specifics may differ, these characteristics tend to be a common thread that run through the fabric of most conspiracy theories, and upon a brief examination, every single one of these features seem to be describing teriology. And to address the elephant in the room, yes, it does sound an awful lot like Scientology, doesn't it? Conspiracy theories often can boost the self-esteem of individuals and groups by shifting the blame for negative events onto others. This allows the self and the group to be perceived as capable and ethical while portraying them as victims of powerful and unethical adversaries. Consequently, conspiracy theories may be more attractive to individuals who feel that their positive self-image or the image of the group is being challenged. In this light, conspiracy Conspiracy theories can be viewed as a paradoxical or counterproductive expression of goal-directed social thinking. Now that we have demonstrated that this theory is clearly a conspiracy theory, let's discuss the philosophical aspect of it from his book. So it is fair to say that the concept of zero has been either misrepresented, misinterpreted or completely misunderstood. I once had a debate with an esteemed professor of mathematics from Chicago University concerning the notion of zero. It went as follows. I was on a publicity tour for the release of the feature film Red Tail and we just so happened to be having dinner at a montage resort in Dana Point, California. I made the statement that there was no such thing as zero. He looked at me with a puzzled look upon his face for a moment and then the professor said, let's say you had an apple and I had an apple and you gave me your apple. How many apples do you have? I said, I have two apples. He said, you don't understand. You gave me your apple. I said, no, you don't understand. As long as you are still inside this universe, whatever you have, I have, because everything in this universe is connected to everything else. Even if you could take my apple and place it into an adjacent universe, I would still have two apples, because as long as that universe is touching this universe, then everything in that universe is still connected to and influenced by every single atom in this universe. Therefore, my giving you my apple is paramount to me, transferring my apple from my left hand to my right hand, because all things are one. It may have been a bit too philosophical for him, but the first law of thermodynamics holds true here. Energy can't be created or destroyed destroyed, it can only be transferred or transformed. Does that help in understanding the logical nature of our current concept and practices associated with zero? So, as you can see, this has nothing to do, what, even though he's discussing zero as a number, this has nothing to do with mathematics once again. This is philosophy. Pretty shallow at one, if you ask me. And the two things I like to underline is, of course, the first part when he talks about, well, I give you my apple, but the apple is still here. Yes, but now <laughs> I understand that the apple might have not been the 
best example that the professor could have given, but in general, you are not disproving number zero whatsoever. You are, if anything, discussing about ownership of objects uh, as opposed to the idea that the location of an object doesn't subtract it from reality, which was never what the professor was trying to point out in the first place. But what I find interesting and revealing in a way is the latter part, which again connects to linguistics, hence my area of expertise. Note how he brings up the concept of thermodynamics. The fact that he's bringing up the concept of thermodynamic is not because in this case it's in fact apt. It has nothing to do whatsoever with the idea of the existence or theoretical existence of number zero. It has everything to do, however, with his intention or goal which is manipulative in nature, which is, look, I'm gonna quote something that sounds smart so that that gives validity to my case. And that in itself is not only a linguistic aspect of this whole discussion, but it is once again manipulative in nature. And even though misquoting thermodynamics to a professor probably didn't have any effect whatsoever, quoting the law of thermodynamics to the layman will. And he knows that. And we can see this at Joe Rogan. <laughs> in conclusion, the reason why this whole thing is absurd is that mathematics works, and that already disproves his claim that mathematics has been wrong in the first place. And what I find hilarious is that the very fact that in order to propose your idea that maths is wrong, you have to use the same technology that was made possible through maths self-defeats your point. The computer you're using, the internet connection, everything that you, Mr. Howard, is using to sort of talk about how maths is wrong is based on the very maths you say is wrong. And yet, if it was wrong, computers wouldn't work. The evidence seems to suggest that indeed teriology is no new math theory. It is indeed a typical case of conspiracy belief, largely rooted in epistemic, existential and societal motivation. And due to its unfalsifiable status, which it was demonstrated, I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson tried to refute it and then immediately Terry considered that an attack, even though within science and academia, that's what you do, that's what a peer review is. A peer review is not someone blindly accepting you and any counter-argument that they propose is an attack at you and therefore you feel, oh, he was vicious. That already demonstrates that he's once again trying to blame and orchestrate everything within the concept of conspiracy theories, which are by default and falsifiable. I believe, however, that this review will have to suffice for now as a well-structured comprehensive analysis based on a solid academic framework, which I could make, will be rejected not in the basis of its merit, but as a part of the conspiracy itself, me becoming one of the agents of the conspiracy, due to the psychological underpinnings of conspiracy beliefs. But regardless of all this, of course, this is no hate towards the actor, but I'm just gonna say he's really good at acting. And the role he chose this time is that of a mathematician. If you're enjoying this video so far, please take a moment to check out my Patreon page. With as little as a $5 support, you can help us ensure that we can continue to produce high-quality and high-researched content. And at the same time, you get access to polls, extra videos, unlisted streams, and much more. Thank you so much. Go to calculate. Yeah, you I do got too. You. you got iPhone? What are we doing? I want both of y'all to do two separate things. I want to do the same thing to start with. Turn it to the side. Okay. All right, now I want you to both hit the number two. Did the whole calculator show up? Hit, hit the, number what? Hit the number two. Number two. two. Go to the square root. It is the second column from the left, third row. It'll have that square yeah. thing. All right, 1.4. 1.414213563793095. Yeah. Holy crap. Now I want you two to do two separate things now. <laughs> two separate things. I want you to multiply it by two, hit times two. Equal, don't you do it. Okay. And I want you to hit X to the third. X to the third, it's going to be. Times third. three? No, X to the third. Oh, X, oh, okay, I see it, I see it. X to the third. Yeah, I got you. All right, 1.1. No, one. You, you didn't hit X to the third. Yes, I did. If you hit X to the third. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're right, you're right. So I go did back that. again. Okay, you so now. Here's where you are. Yeah, 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 I'm two, good. Two. Square root. Square root. And hit X to the third. All right, 2.82. 2.82. 4271. 2174, 6190, the same value you got. Yeah. By multiplying it by two. Yeah. And he just cubed it. Divide it by two again. Both of y'all. Divide, divide by two. Divide it by two. No, divide by two. <laughs> hit equal. Now, cube it again. Hit X to the third. Yeah. You see that loop? Yeah. That's saying X cubed is equal to 2X, which is equal to X plus X. That's an unnatural equation. That's a mathematical fallacy. And that's the beginning of your math. 
That's how I invented tangential flight because 